Wow, hero, that's a lot to live up to. Um, you know, my topic today is consistent with the theme of the last uh, segment here in, in Raleigh. It's alchemy. And so uh, we're going to talk about alchemy turning ideas into reality. Okay, right here. All right, I got to watch my head. All right, I'm going to stand to the side so I don't get knocked in the head. And so, uh, let's see if we got our slide. There it is, turning ideas into reality. Now, as designers, we're usually fulfilling the needs of a client. Uh, it could be a space for um, you know, a building that meets certain programmatic requirements. It could be a product that is designed to uh, you know, perform a certain task. Or a graphic piece. Designers uh, in the graphic arena you know, want to create something that um, solves a problem and conveys a certain message. And usually, the solutions fulfill the need of a client. And so, um, on the other hand, art need only meet one criteria. It needs to be pleasing to the audience. And so what is it that elevates certain buildings, certain designs, to that level of art? You know, design, architecture specifically, can reach that uh, beyond the utilitarian and, and requirements and ascend to a level uh, of art. And we can all think of examples of buildings that, you know, delight us or inspire us and fulfill an intended need at the same time. And the question is then, how do you elevate design to that higher level? And I would argue that um, certain buildings do resonate with occupants, the passers-by, uh, and designs can be thought-provoking. Buildings, everyday buildings, can, can really be inspiring, joyful, or even exuberant, or somber. On the other hand, they can also be mundane and just uh, even worse, you know, bad. Um, and I would, I would say that uh, what, what differentiates those buildings that make it to that higher level is the ability of the design to elicit an emotional response. There's a connection some way. And it is the underlying idea anchoring that design that is the catalyst for that emotional connection. Let's look more closely at this notion of idea. Well, what does idea mean? Well, the dictionary says an idea is something such as a thought or a connection, conception, that potentially or actually exists in the mind as a product of mental activity. Well, that, that's kind of, you know, academic. I would simplify that and say that an idea starts with a thought. It's not an idea yet if it's in your head, right? It, but it begins there, it's singular, it's a thought. And then there's a, an expression of the idea in some way. It could be verbal or written communication. Uh, it could be a sketch, a, a model. It could be a performance. And so that expression allows people to, to share in it, and there's some action usually taken, whether, whether you build the building or you know, that piece that you design as a graphic designer is realized. And quite often that action you know, triggers back around to the thought process. It, it, it tells you how to refine it, that feedback is, is a loop that happens, and it's a refinement that makes your idea even stronger. Now, the, the, the power of an idea cannot be overstated. Leonardo da Vinci, in 1483, had a thought. A person could jump from any given height and ascend to the ground without being harmed by use of this device. It was expressed through a sketch. 500 years later, in the year 2000, a British man actually jumped from a hot air balloon 10,000 feet in the air and ascended safely to the ground. Now, he was wearing a conventional parachute, just in case. <laughs> uh, and actually, he uh, ejected from this and, and came down because that, that contraption weighed 180 pounds. But it was built with period tools that would have been found at the time of, of uh, da Vinci with materials, um, you know, native to Milan at the time. Now, what, what really gets me is that uh, in medieval Milan, there wasn't even any place high enough to jump from in, in order to do that. <laughs> and so while, while architects are, are known to be patient, you know, our designs can take years and sometimes a decade to realize. I think 500 years is quite a bit too long to wait to, for that. And so uh, aside from its visionary and forward-thinking attributes, this enduring idea has a simple elegance to it. 
and I believe that this is a critical part of its staying power and its universal comprehension. You know, people just simply get it. You look at it and you get it, even though there were no airplanes then. It just, it just made sense. Now, my favorite quote that speaks to this notion of clarity comes from Charles Mingus, the renowned jazz bassist. He said, making the simple complicated is commonplace. Making the complicated simple, awesomely simple, that's creativity. Marcel Bory, an architect, put it this way. I tried always in my furniture to find the last solution, the simplest way. And, and architects have a way of, you know, adopting furniture. It, for, to us, it's almost like small buildings. You know, we, we see design at, at all different scales. Charles Eames said, I think of myself officially as an architect. I can't help but look at problems around us as problems of structure. And structure is architecture. So uh, years ago, uh, when I was much younger, you know, I grappled with this notion of how do you turn simple, clear ideas into reality uh, at the smaller scale, at the furniture scale. Uh, after all, architecture is a profession that reveres gray hair, and I'm happy to have a little bit of this now. Uh, and so if you're, if you're looking to explore you know, design theory, there aren't often you know, uh, clients and real buildings to, to, to work on. So I had this simple idea about a piece of furniture. Two trees, the canopy being the tabletop, and then the structure of, that, of those tree limbs converge and come down to the ground. Simple idea. The two shafts coming up are comprised of, of eight by eight tightly packed cylinders. So there's uh, 64 twice 128. And as they approach the tabletop, that tight grid expands to a corresponding grid that's, that's spread out on the tabletop. And so uh, you go from tree trunk to branches and you support the table. Well, I'm afraid that Charles Mingus would say I was taking the simple and making it rather complicated sure he'd be disappointed. But remember that diagram, you know, the action led to more thought and that cycle, that iterative cycle uh, started again and it informed yet a, another design. Uh, this time I, I looked at the natural order of things that uh, at the base of a tree it, it really is regular. It's either cylindrical, it could be you know, elliptical, but that it starts at a regular form, a, an organic form not a square. And so this design begins with the branches tightly packed around an ellipse and then they come up uh, and tape in a tapered form and meet the tabletop. Now it looks complex but the, the simplicity here is that there are only five profiles of, of branch um, shapes but they use nine times each and by turning and rotating them in, in, in different degrees, it produces uh, what looks like a, a random, very organic uh, structure. And so the clarity of this design is evident. You know, you don't have to know that to, to look and see that, that it seems to work. Realizing architecture in the scale of actual buildings adds a lot of complexity uh, to this, this proposition, right? I mean, you've got context to deal with, Buildings have surroundings. You have to respond to that. There are requirements of the client. Remember? The utility of things. You have to meet a purpose. It has to be useful. There are regulatory mandates, uh, such as building codes, zoning regulations, design review panels. We have that here in Raleigh. Um, and there are schedules and budgets. So all, all these other parameters uh, come into play. And, you know, architects, we say that the, the tighter the constraints, the better the opportunity for success. And so uh, it's also a task that's not individual. Um, you know, this furniture design, yes, you can go back and work on it yourself. Architecture is a highly collaborative effort. It's never done on a singular basis, this, despite what some of the star architects may, may tell you. And so in this broader context, a strong idea is, is really critical because it can be a call to action. It can be a rallying point to the design team 
including architects and, and others who contribute. Um, and those simple and clear ideas are really most apparent in the bigger scheme of architecture when you have these, these collaborative teams. And just, just a few examples of, of the higher level of complexity. Now, here's a, a, a good example. Um, in the introduction, it was mentioned that we're on a, a team to design the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. Now, in terms of context, it, it couldn't be more dynamic. We are in the shadow of the Washington Monument. And so the scrutiny on this site is, is incredible. Um, there is a purpose and a use, right? That purpose is explained in a 1,200-page programming document. <laughs> so it's not, it's not merely finding something uh, wonderful to do. Um, and the regulatory agencies certainly have it. And now the mother of all constraints and the father, that's budget and schedule. Um, are, are certainly um, you know, really, really strong in this. And the fact that there are four architects plus dozens of consultants. You know, you've got exhibit designers, engineers, the Smithsonian in and of itself. It's like the Vatican. It's its own city. <laughs> They've got you know, different competing uh, elements even within that structure. And so w within that, you know, I, I think that the beauty of a simple and clear idea becomes even, even more powerful. And I also would say that, that subtlety is important. You know, an idea, that a driver for a design is fine, but it doesn't have to be literal, and it doesn't have to smack you in the face. You know, it, it, and in fact, <laughs> it, it's, it's better, in my opinion, if, you know, it, you have to work a little bit to figure it out. Okay? And, and your subconscious mind helps you to do that. Again, a diagram of the site, so there are views to and from these incredible uh, monuments around us. It's in the knuckle, the hinge that links the, um, the mall with the Washington Monument grounds and the White House. So what, what are some of the drivers? We knew that the building would certainly uh, tell some of the stories, some of the difficult stories of African Americans in this country. And so that's important to do, to tell the truth. But also, uh, it shouldn't be about uh, victims and perpetrators. Uh, there should be celebration, exuberance, joy uh, in there as well. The southern tradition of the porch, meaning, you know, let's welcome people in. This is a, a place for all Americans. The uh, director, Lonnie Bunch, would say that the African-American story is the quintessential American story. And, and also the African uh, connection, the tripartite column, you know, similar to Western culture, where there's a base, a body, and a capital. In this case, the capital is a crown or a corona. These were all drivers for the design. And when you combine those with the creative mind of David Ajay, our, our lead designer from uh, London, you know, this, this idea of the corona became the central figure for the design. Uh, it's an unusual shape. Uh, you don't see it that often in terms of the angles, the uplifted geometry. And we took our cues from our nearest neighbor, the Washington Monument. The angle of the capstone is at 17 and a half degrees and also the panel sizes, you know, the, that modularity uh, we're cueing off of that as well. And so the building is three-tiered corona. The angle matches the Washington Monument as if an inverted pyramid is coming down. Clad in, in a bronze panel system, and the uh, openings allow us to regulate the light coming in and views going out, depending on where you are in the building and your solar orientation. And as we thought about you know, uh, the patterning, we looked to New Orleans and Charleston and the tradition of ironwork by freed slaves and other artisans. And to take that uh, and interpret that in a modern way with computers so that the, the patterns are there and the key points. And it's one of those subtle references again. You might not look at that and say, that's a floral pattern from Charleston. But, but something about it is familiar and it's, it's comfortable. And by modulating uh, the permeability, uh, you, you regulate the views and the solar, solar gain. Modeling, expression of the idea. 
in the porch, a place of celebration, a place where uh, the landscape is drawn into the building, the interior comes out, and you have this welcoming gesture on the south side uh, with a reflecting pool that creates almost a, a microclimate as the, the water evaporates and, and air circulates. It's, it's cooling, it's welcoming. People will get to the end of the mall and say, I'm going in there, I'm, I'm tired, I'm hot, I'm going in there. What's inside? And the view is if the Washington Monument were over your left shoulder. So, I would say that moving from thought to expression to action, uh, in 2015, Washington, D.C. will have its newest national museum on the Mall in Washington, D.C. Thank you very much.